But the yep. title of the uh, message this morning, you can just get ready when you're ready. Get ready. The title of our message this morning is The Magnificat of uh, Mary Song. And I'm going to have you turn in your Bible to the Gospel according to Luke. We are in Luke's Gospel. We're in chapter 2. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 42. In Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 42. And again, I apologize for my voice uh, cracking the top of this morning. I have a, I've had a cold or the flu for about three, four days now. So we're going we're gonna to do our very best this morning. All right, so we're in uh, Luke, chapter 2. And it begins telling us a little bit of information about the Lord Jesus Christ at age 12. And isn't it, uh, I mean, we're curious. We, we like to know every detail there is to know about the Lord. The Bible doesn't say very much about Jesus as a child. We don't learn too much about his childhood. Uh, but here's one section of scripture that does mention his childhood, and it's going to lead right up to, the, to Mary's song, which is called the Magnificat. Uh, verse 42, And when he, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem, after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So Jesus is hanging out. <laughs> uh, Joseph and Mary, Joseph being his uh, stepfather, his legal, his legal father, and Mary, his mom, kept going. After the festival's over, they're heading back. And you know how it is when you get together with family, a big gathering. Uh, you don't pay such close attention to your kids. You're talking to your cousins and your relatives and your family, and you're having a good time, and, and uh, that's what they're doing. They're hanging out to talk to people and stuff, and they, they keep moving. And, and it's a little, a little time goes past before they realize, wait a minute, we, we don't have Jesus with us. <laughs> the original home alone. <laughs> they, they, leave, they leave Jesus behind. Uh, by the way, you don't ever want to leave Jesus behind. Amen. Amen. Don't, go, don't go anywhere without Jesus. Amen. Get rid of express card. Get rid of him. <laughs> uh, but look at verse 44. But they supposing him to have been in the company, they thought he was with, you know, the family. They thought he was with the crew. Went a day's journey. Wow, look how much time has gone by. <laughs> They've been traveling for a whole day, and they don't even recognize the fact that Jesus isn't right there with them. That's amazing. That's really something. Now, Joseph and Mary had children after Jesus. So it's not like they only had Jesus. It's not they. It would have been her. Because Joseph is not his biological father. We'll get to that in a minute. But they traveled for a whole day. Their other children don't appear to be missing, right? <laughs> Jesus had sisters, plural, and brothers, plural, right? But they're, they're not even mentioned here as missing. Amen. But the parents leave, a whole day goes by, and they recognize, whoa, we left Jesus behind. Well, what do you do? You stop and you got to go back and you got to get him, right? It's like you're traveling on, um, I don't know, New York State Thruway or something. You stop and use the restroom, right? You let the kids out, they use the bathroom, you get in the car, and you keep driving, you're driving for a whole day, and you, you realize one of the kids isn't in the car. <laughs> you gotta get in the car, you gotta go back to whatever the stop was, right? Why? And uh, <laughs> is like, why? why? Oh, if it was Dennis, maybe we wouldn't turn around and go back. But, <laughs> but they, they, they traveled a whole day's journey before realizing that Jesus wasn't with them. This is really an amazing thing, I think. We read through this sometimes, and we just brush right by it like it's not a big deal, but we're going to move a little slower this morning, not too slow. And I want to point out a few things here that I think maybe people don't really recognize or think about, or maybe we just kind of read past. But verse 44, but they supposing him to have been in the, in the company when a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk. So they're looking with their other relatives, saying, do you know where Jesus is? Is he with you? I thought he was with you. But he's not with you? 
What do you mean he's not with you? Well, where is he then? You know, he's not with his cousin John. He's not with his cousin, right? Yeah. His kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they couldn't find him, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. So now they're going to go back a day's journey. Think about that. You travel for 24 hours, a whole day you're traveling, and now you got to turn around and you got to go back. And it came to pass that after, look how long, three days. They traveled for one day, not realizing that he wasn't around. Then it says, and it came to pass, after three days they found him. So they're looking for, they missed Jesus for one day. They turn around, they go back, that's another day. And then there's a couple of more days that go by, they're looking for him. And it's astonishing when we stop to consider where was Jesus and what was he doing. Because four days have gone by since you've seen mom and stepdad. And it came to pass after three days, verse 46, they found him where? In the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, these are the PhDs, both hearing them and asking them questions. Can you imagine this? This 12-year-old is sitting talking to the doctors and he's asking them questions they can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> this little 12 year old he's been there for days talking to them, turning them upside down asking questions that they can't ask so they're, they're going to be astonished of course and look at verse 47 and all that heard him those doctors were astonished at his understanding and answers this 12 year old can answer their questions wow and we're talking about the humanity of Christ here. They're emphasizing the fact that he's a 12-year-old boy. They're not emphasizing the fact that he's God. He is God, of course, in the flesh, right? It was from the very beginning. But as a man in his humanity, he has to grow. He has to learn. He has to, to, to do the same kinds of things that you and I have to do. We have to learn how to read and write. We have to study books and read and learn and grow. And so he has to do the same thing as a man in his humanity. Verse 48, and when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother, that's Mary, said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Uh, excuse me, why hast thou thus dealt with us? In other words, why did you do this to us? Well, Jesus didn't leave. <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. Right? They took off. They didn't stop and check to make sure the kids are there and there's no sin on Jesus' part. There's no failure on his part. They just took off without him. She says, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? So mom's not too happy. Behold, listen to what Mary says. We're talking about Mary today, right? And we're going to correct some misnomers about Mary. Look what Mary says. She says, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, listen to what she says. Behold, Thy father. Stop and think about that for a second. She says, Behold your dad, behold your father. And I have sought thee sorrowing. We're sorrowful. We're unhappy. We're not feeling very good right now. We've been looking for you. Where were you? That's what Mary says to him. And this really caught my attention when I started to read this. Not only because of what she says to the Lord Jesus Christ, this 12-year-old boy who happens to be God in the flesh, right? His earthly mom, what she says to him, but his response is astonishing that this 12-year-old boy responds to his mom. And I want, you to, I want you to catch this. Please don't miss this. Look at verse 49. And he said unto them, here's Jesus' reply, and he said unto them, how is it that ye, right, that's y'all, how is it that you all sought me? Wish ye not, don't you know, didn't you know, that I must be about my father's business? Now Mary just called Joseph his father. Jesus didn't acknowledge him as his heavenly father. He says, my father. I'm about my father's business. Now, Joseph is his legal dad. He's his stepfather. Yes. Jesus is not denying Mary's his mother. He's not denying that Joseph is his legal father, his stepfather. 
He's not denying that. But he's not putting any emphasis on that whatsoever. He's, his mom made, the, made that point, but he's just brushed that aside. He said, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? My father's business. He's not about Joseph's business here. He's about God the Father's business here. That's important that we don't miss that. And they understood not. Isn't this something? And they understood not the same which he spake unto them. It went right past them. A lot of times, you know, you share scripture with somebody. You'll be witnessing, you'll be sharing the scripture with somebody. It'll go right past them. Especially unsaved people. They're spiritually discerned. They don't understand most of what you have to say about the gospel. They can't even begin to know what you're talking about. But it's a sad thing today that a lot of Christians don't understand things too. You talk about some simple, basic, easy to understand things from the Word of God. They don't have the teaching. They don't have the doctrine. They don't have the foundation. It goes right past them. They don't know what you're talking about. And we talk about putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And we've used this illustration in the past. You cannot give someone algebra, an algebraic equation, and expect them to resolve that if they don't know how to add and subtract. Mm -hmm. If they don't know how to multiply and divide. Right? You've got to have a foundation. Mary certainly had a fantastic foundation. And really, she should have understood this. Jesus says, wish she not. How is it that you don't understand, at 12 years old, that I must be about my father's business? Think about that. I want you to process that just for a minute. Think about that. It's kind of like saying, you know who I am. You know who I am. Of course you know who I am. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it, Juni. That didn't go past Juni. Juni got it right away. You know, don't you know who I am? Don't you remember the angel? <laughs> remember the angel that, that told you that made the announcement? Right? Remember? Remember? And now here I am, 12 years old. You're surprised that I'm taking care of Dan's business, my father's business? It's amazing. How is it that we read past that? And it's like nothing. This thing should keep you up tonight thinking, wow, look at this conversation between Jesus and Mary. It's incredible. <laughs> wow. This blew me away. My throat's been so sore I can hardly speak. But I've been processing this all week, just kind of thinking about this. I'm like, this is some really good stuff. Oh, I love this. I can't wait to preach this. All right, okay, let's, let's move on. Look at verse 51. And he went down with them. Jesus did not stay there. He's 12 years old. He's under age. He's not considered an adult yet. All right? And he went down with them. He went with mom and his stepdad and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. He submitted himself. He was under submission to his mother and his, and his stepfather. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Isn't that something? Mary remembers all these strange things that take place because an angel came to her. And she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to that in just a minute here when we look at her song. But she should have understood this because of what happened to her before. And look at verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So here's God in the form of a man. At this point, he's a boy, he's 12 years old, he's a young, young, young child, and he's having to learn things, he's having to study, he's having to read. Now we say, oh, he's God, he's God, he's God. Oh, yes, he is God. But as a man, he has to read, he has to study scripture, he has to memorize scripture also. He has to do the same things that you and I have to do. And too often, I think we, we kind of tell ourselves, well, he's, he's God. Well, God has no, he has no problem, he's, he's God. Well, as God, he would have no problem, but he's also a man, fully God, fully man, and one person forever. There, we have a, an expression for that, a name for that, a title for that. It's called the hypostatic union, right? God became human. God became a man. He was 100% God. He never stopped being God. That's not possible. He also took upon him the form of a man. So he's 100% human, and he's 100% God. Now the part of him that is 100% human 
gets hungry, gets tired, gets sleepy, doesn't know everything, has to learn things, has to study like you and I must study to learn and to grow and to come to an understanding. Right? So, now Mary's mentioned in Scripture quite a few times, by the way. I think we focus our attention primarily on the four Gospels when we think of Mary, but she's actually mentioned throughout Scripture. And too often people put Mary on a pedestal beyond what the Scripture does. Now, yes, she is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. She is the mother of the humanity of Christ. But it's improper, for example, when the Catholics call Mary the mother of God. God, as God, does not have a mother. That's blasphemy. That's very inappropriate. We never refer to Mary as the mother of God. She is the, she is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, she is. But she's the mother of his humanity. She's the mother of his humanity. And when we speak of Mary, we want to understand that and keep that in its proper context. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I'm going to have you flip there with me quickly. Because Mary, Mary is alluded to or referred to in other places in the scripture. But she's never presented as the co-mediator. She's never presented as a co-redeemer. And uh, people, unfortunately, and I am referring primarily to the Catholics, primarily will exalt her beyond the position that she's been given in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 reads, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. You know, signs were given to the nation of Israel, of course. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, that's Mary, referring to Mary, shall conceive. How can a virgin conceive? She can't do that without the help of a man. Right? But he says she'll be a virgin and she'll conceive. So we have, we have a miracle here. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. I'm reading in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And I'll pronounce that name again because you've heard it pronounced Emmanuel. But the way that's correctly pronounced in the Hebrew is e manu -el. What does e manu -el mean? We see that L, e -el, like at the end of my name. My name is Michael. Michael. My name is a question in the Hebrew language. The question is, who is like God? Well, the answer is no one, of course. Right? And then uh, a name like Daniel. Dan, Dan L. E L. God is my judge. All of these Hebrew names, Joe L, Mike L, Dan L, the E L, Imanu L, literally means God with us. This is an astonishing name, Emmanuel, God with us. When, when God became a man, and they called him Emmanuel, they're telling you, so there's no confusion, that this is God in the form of a human being. God has become man. And we have this prophecy in the book of Isaiah that references the Virgin Mary. Now, the fact that Mary is a virgin is important because Joseph is not his biological father. No man became his biological father. We know that the sinful nature is passed on to the child in every case because of the father, not because of the mother. So the fact that Mary is a virgin here is important. And he's telling you that that sinful nature, which we all have, that lower sinful nature, was not passed on to Emmanuel. Jesus did not have a sinful nature. He was not born in Adam. Amen? Amen? We want to make sure we understand that he was born without a sinful nature. Amen. Very important. If he was born with a sinful nature, he can't save us. Because right. wouldn't he be able to mm -hmm. save himself? He has to be born without a sinful nature. And Mary has to be a virgin. So there's no question as to... Christ's 
being without a sinful nature, having a human father. So why do people attack the, the virgin birth or the fact that Mary was a virgin? They attack that because they don't want Jesus to be the Son of God. Right. They don't want the Holy Spirit to be the Father of Christ, to have fathered the child. And when we read that account, we learn that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, right? And planted in her womb those necessary elements, that seed. She didn't have a seed, she's a woman. That seed came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit planted the seed, and she conceived. So here she is pregnant, and we can't even begin to imagine what she's going through. She's pregnant, and nobody touched her. We have a lot of women today that say, oh, there must be another virgin birth. I didn't know man touched me. <laughs> I hear that on some of the judge shows that I have, right? Mary Povich. Mary Povich, really. Mary Povich especially. They say, oh, no, 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 no. There was only one virgin birth. Somebody did touch you. Right? When I say, well, well, he's not the father. This one's not the father. She goes, well, must have been a virgin birth. No, no, no. Somebody touched you. <laughs> but, but in the case of Mary, nobody touched her. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her and planted in her womb. So let's go back to Luke, chapter 2. And I want you to draw, I want to draw your attention to... Okay, we're going to look at... There's more than one Mary mentioned in the Bible. So every time you see the word Mary, don't get confused and think, oh, this is Jesus' mother. There are several Marys actually mentioned in Scripture. And that's important that we, that we, that we recognize that. Uh, we've got uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, yes. We also have Mary Magdalene. Uh, there's several Marys. Mary of Siloam. And I don't want to take too much time talking about the different Marys. Other than to, to, just to mention the fact that, yes, in fact, there is more than one Mary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 1. And let's actually take a look at uh, the Magnificat, her song. We know the angel came in this chapter and spoke to her. I'll jump on, I'll begin at verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The angel does not say you're God. The angel does not say you're co-mediator, you're co-redeemer. The, the angel doesn't say any of that. That's not true. That's false teaching and false doctrine. He says, Hail, thou art highly favored. Favored of God, right? The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Amongst all the women of the earth, Mary is set apart. She is blessed. We don't ever want to deny that fact. Right? That's true. We're in verse 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind, what manner of salutation this should be. In other words, what is this angel talking about? Mary doesn't know. What, what's going on here? And the angel said to her, fear not. Isn't that interesting? The angel says, fear not. We see that expression, fear not, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 365 times in the Bible. Uh, so if God is saying anything to you through an angel or just through the scripture in general, every single day you got a fear not. Don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. We know that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Mary found favor with God. And he says, verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. These are prophecies Mary would have most certainly been familiar with. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? In other words, she's a virgin. <clears throat> she's not lying to the angel who would have known better. Can you imagine if she'd been sleeping around with a whole bunch of men? And she says to the angel, Oh, well, 
Well, how can this happen? I don't know anybody. The angel would have corrected her. He said, oh, yes, you have known some people too. <laughs> <coughs> and the angel answered, said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. <coughs> Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, <clears throat> she hath also conceived a son in her old age. So the angel is really giving her some information here. <laughs> he's, he's all up in Elizabeth's business. <laughs> he's telling your cousin's pregnant, by the way. <laughs> and she's six months before you. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. <clears throat> For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. <clears throat> well, look, drop down to verse uh, 42. And she spake out, uh, she's, I'm sorry, verse 41, It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. That's reflex motility, of course. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art, art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of the Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. Talking about Mary. Mary's blessed because she was a believer. She believed she had faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. In other words... God is going to keep his word. When God tells you something, it's a fact. Even though it hasn't happened yet, it's as good as done. Now, here's the song. Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Wow, she's praising God. She's, she's worshiping him. And my spirit rejoiced in God, my Savior. Please don't miss the point that's being made here. Mary calls God her Savior. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you use the word Savior as she does here, there's a very humble recognition of your condition. What is Mary's condition? Mary is just like you and just like me. She's a sinner. Right? She's a sinner. She, she commits sins. A lot of people teach that Mary never sinned. They even call her the Immaculate Conception. She had no sin. She could conceive Jesus because she herself had no sin. That's absolutely false. Mm. Well, if that's true, then what about her mother? If Mary had no sin, and she did have sin, but if she had no sin, how did she get to a place where she could have no sin? Was she born by a mother and a father who weren't sinners? And how, how could they be without sin? You have to keep going back, 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 back. And then you're right back to Adam and Eve, who we know were sinners. Right? So this idea that Mary had no sin is absolutely false. Absolutely false. Mary was a sinner. Right? Now, she's not out there sleeping around with people. She's not a super sinner like most of us. Right? But Mary was a sinner. She was a sinner. She had sins. She was not perfect. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. So, of all the children that were born through Adam, not one of them was without sin. That sinful nature has been passed on to all of us. The fact that Mary was a virgin is important because the sinful nature was not passed on to the humanity of Christ. Jesus was not born a sinner. Mary was born a sinner, but she does not pass her sinful nature on to her son. Why? Because no woman is able to pass on the, the sinful nature of Adam, that, ad that Adamic nature, onto her child. Men pass their sinful nature onto their offspring, onto their children. So, ladies, you're, you're sort of off the hook in that one regard. Amen? Amen. Well, let's keep reading. Uh, and she spake out with a loud voice. So Mary lifts her voice here, and she says in a loud voice, Blessed art thou among women, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, let's, uh, I'm on the wrong verse here, let's drop down a little bit, verse 45, and blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be performance, 
So Mary starts praising God in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Verse 47. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded... What is Mary's estate? She says it here. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. But she's in a humble and low estate. By the way, I should mention that these are not rich folks, by the way. Mary's not rich. And uh, we'll talk more about that later, but she, she's in a very humble estate. They don't live in a palace. They're not rich. We know Jesus was born in a stable, right? In a, in a feeding trough, literally. They call it a manger. It's literally a feeding trough. He's born in, in very humble circumstances. For he that is mighty has done great things, has done to me great things, and holy is his name. Mary knows the Lord. She is definitely a saved woman. She's definitely a godly woman. And we should recognize that. Christians too often attack Mary because Catholics take Mary and go too far in the wrong direction. So I hear a lot of Christians attacking her. And it's not our place to attack the mother of the Lord. She's a godly woman. She's a blessed woman. And, and we just want to keep this in perspective. She's not taking any honor and praise and glory unto herself. And she would, she would turn in her grave. She's not in heaven. Nobody's in heaven. The Bible says no man is ascending into heaven. David's not even in heaven, right? Mary's not in heaven either. She, but she would turn over in her grave if she recognized what people were doing with her name today, exalting her above Christ, uh, putting her up on a pedestal. Bible says she's lowly in a, in, a, in a low estate here, and she's recognizing that. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. That's what she says. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. This is how she describes herself. The low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done, great, hath done to me great things. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. So we can say something else about Mary. Something wonderful here. Mary feared the Lord. I'd like to ask a question of you today. Do you fear the Lord? Do you reverence the Lord? Do you recognize who God is? Are you conscious of the fact of, of who you have to deal with? Job said, the fear, the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs, excuse me. It's the beginning of wisdom. That's the first thing we need to master in life is fear. Have a reverential fear and respect for the Lord, knowing who he is. And she says, his mercy is on them that fear him. To whom does God show mercy? God shows mercy to those that fear him. Mary feared the Lord. Amen? Amen. Verse 51, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud. What does God do to the arrogant? The proud? He scatters them. He sets them at naught. The proud in, in their imagination of their hearts. And people sometimes think that they're a big deal. They think they're hot stuff. And they have this, this pride. The Bible says God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God recognizes those who fear him. Look at verse 52. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. So here Mary is describing herself again. She describes herself as of low degree. She's not making herself super important like some churches are doing today like some denominations are doing today. She describes herself in her own words as being of low degree and of low estate. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Mary was exalted by the Lord himself. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent them away empty. This is Mary's song, by the way. This is what she's singing. He hath hope in his servant Israel. He's helped Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And she's part of Israel, is she not? Of course she is. As he spake to our fathers, 
to Abraham and to his seed forever. And it goes on to say in verse 56, because that's the end of her song, and Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So she stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. Which was like, that's a right about the time that she would have been having her baby. She sound, sounds like she stayed until the baby was born, John. Jesus' cousin is John. John is the forerunner who announces the coming of Messiah, right? So, I'm also going to have you turn quickly to John chapter uh, chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple more verses, and we're, and we're just about done for today. We're at a relatively short message today. John chapter 2. And I want to draw your attention to verse 4, because now Jesus is of age. He's not 12 years old anymore. He's not a little boy. And I, I, I want to draw your attention to Jesus' perspective of his mother Mary. How did Jesus treat his own mother? Never sinfully, never disrespectfully, of course. But does Jesus look at her as co-mediator? Does Jesus need his mother's help as a mediator? Does he need his mother's help as a redeemer? Doing his job as our savior, as some would present? That's obviously he doesn't. But let's look at some scripture that highlights that fact. Now, let me start with uh, actually verse 1 in chapter 2. This is the marriage in Cana. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So Jesus is at a, he's at a marriage. Somebody's getting married. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. They ran out of wine. And Jesus said unto her, Now look at Jesus' response to Mary. He doesn't say, Mom, like we would say today, right? Mom, Mom, this, that, or other. Jesus says, Woman, that's not rude, by the way. That was normal for an adult son to talk to his mother that way. That's, that's not a sin. Jesus never sinned. He was never rude or impolite, especially to his mother. He may have overturned some tables, though, right? <laughs> but he's not overturning any table here. But he is helping his mother to understand her place in the mix here. Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. In other words, you don't get to tell me when to perform a miracle. You're not part of this. You don't get to dictate that. She's not to give him instructions. He's a man. He's an adult now. He's a fully grown man. And you know, sometimes as parents, it's very hard for us not to get too involved in the lives of our children. Sometimes as parents, it's very difficult for us not to give instructions to our children. You know, if, if your child comes to you and asks you for help, I'm, ha I'm happy to give my kids words of advice. I'm just frustrated because half the time they won't listen. You'll come and you'll ask me for advice, but then you don't take the advice that I gave you, <laughs> right? So, so I, I'm somewhat reluctant. I'll step back out of the way. And uh, if they ask for help, I'll say, well, this is what I would do if I were in your situation. This is what, yeah, this is what I would do. And if, and if it lines up with Scripture and I can, I can pull it out of Scripture, I always like to give that support. Well, according to what the Scripture says, blah, 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 this is the decision I would make. But Jesus is not asking Mary for advice. He hasn't solicited her help. She's offering her help. And he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? She's out of place here. She, she doesn't get to give him instruction. She, she doesn't get to participate in this. Verse 5, his mother saith unto the servant, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So she steps back out of the way now. He's, he doesn't say, Mom, thank you for your help. <laughs> Mom, what do you think I should, uh, you know, he says, Woman, what have I, what have, what have I, have, what have I to do with thee? You're, you're not a part of this. I'm going to perform the miracle. The miracle is, is going to bring honor and glory to God the Father. Jesus is going to do it, of course. But Mary, Mary's not a part of this. And she's to step back and to get out of the way, which she does do. Right? And he goes on and he fills the water pots and we know the rest. Uh, let's turn also to John, we're still in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 25. <coughs> and
and I bring these verses merely so that you can see Jesus' perspective on Mary. John, what? Uh, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 25 and verse 26. Verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. We got three Marys in one verse. Remember earlier I mentioned that there's more than one Mary in well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the four Gospels? We have more than one Mary mentioned in what is called the New Testament. Okay? So we always want to make sure we know which Mary we're talking about. And is it, and is it Mary the mother of Jesus, right? Look at verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, now he's, Jesus is, he's on the cross. He's dying, paying for the sins of the world. He's on the cross and he's dying. And his mother is there at the cross. Now you know the disciples took off. Peter wasn't there. Remember Peter said, oh Lord, I'll fight for you. No, this is not going to happen to you. He pulled out his sword. He cut off the Malchus' ear. And Jesus said, put your sword away. And he healed Malchus' ear. But Peter did not show up at the cross. We do have a disciple at the cross. One of those 12 guys did show up. And it was John, the beloved. See, the rest of the people at the cross, believers that is, are women. The women showed up. And Jesus' mother is there. And it's interesting, verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, when he saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, that's John, he saw John and he saw his mother, he saith unto his mother, he doesn't say, Mom, he says, Woman, behold thy son. Isn't that interesting? He says, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, to John, Behold thy mother. Isn't that interesting? And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own house. Now, some have speculated, and I, and I agree, I don't like to speculate, but we don't see Joseph mentioned anymore. Joseph is phased out relatively quick. Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. If his stepfather was alive, there would be no need for Jesus to tell John to take care of his mother. She would have a husband to take care of her. So she's a widower. She's a widower. Her husband had died at some point. Joseph served his purpose. We see him taking Jesus to Egypt. But Joseph is phased out. We don't see him mentioned at all, all throughout the Gospels. Very little is mentioned of Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. The story of the temple is the last time he's mentioned. He's mentioned briefly, very briefly. He's, he's phased out. He dies at some point. And Jesus says as he's dying here on the cross to John, first he says to his mom, Woman, behold thy son. And then he turns to John and says to John, Behold your mother. Right? He turns the responsibility of the care of his mother, taking care of his mother because she's getting older, She's not some spring chicken anymore. She's getting older. We know Jesus lived 33 years, right? So 33 plus whatever she was when she had him. And she could have been very young when she had him, right? She could have been in her late teens or, or whatever. Women had babies early back then. But that's considered old back then. So somebody has to take care of her. And her care is turned over to the Apostle John. And that's interesting because we know John, of all the Apostles, was not martyred. Isn't that interesting? John was not martyred. Peter was martyred. James was martyred. Now, Jesus has brothers and sisters. Couldn't the brothers and sisters have taken care of their mom? But he doesn't entrust them to take care of his mom. He entrusts the care of Mary to the Apostle John. And we know that John lived a long time and died on the Isle of Patmos as an old man, we're told. Right, according to history, we're told. So, wow, that's fascinating. So, so what, are we, what conclusion are we to draw? Number one, Mary is the mother of the humanity of Christ. It's very inappropriate to use the expression, the mother of God. 
it's very inappropriate to pray directly to Mary. Jesus taught us how to pray. We're to pray to God the Father in the name of the Son, under the control and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You're not, you're not to pray to Mary. You're not to pray to the saints. You're to pray to God himself. And Mary does not answer prayer. Mary does not receive prayer. Mary's not awake and alive and alert. That's another important facet of this whole teaching, which we understand that when you're dead, you're really dead. The Bible says the living know that they're going to die, but the dead know nothing. Mary has died. Mary is not awake and alert on the other side, receiving prayers from people, answering their prayers. Right? Going before the Lord Jesus Christ, talking to her son about some prayer that somebody's praying down here. That's very inappropriate. When you, when you die, you're actually dead. Mary has died. Mary is not alive and alert, listening to prayers, answering prayers. That's not even a possibility. Not even a possibility. So, we need to understand that. And moving forward as we're sharing with others, especially our friends who happen to be Catholic. We want to bring them to the Scripture. Because without opening the Bible and actually looking at what the Scripture says, you'll never understand the truth. You'll never be able to embrace the truth. And we need to hear the truth to be saved. We need to hear the truth to be saved. We need to hear the Gospel to be saved. So let's talk for just a quick minute here about what the Gospel is. We do it every week. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1 through 4. And if you've got your program, you can look on the back of the program. It's right there. And Paul speaking in chapter 15. This is the gospel which Paul calls my gospel. He uses that expression three times. My gospel, which is the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel, which I preached unto you. This is what Paul preached. The only gospel that saves today, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved. How are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith, by believing Paul's gospel. He said, if you keep in mind memory what I preached on you, you've got to have remembered what Paul said, right? You, 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 or, or did you believe in vain? Did you believe some other gospel? This is testing yourself, right? What did I actually believe? Did I actually believe the gospel? Did I actually hear the gospel? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now Paul's going to tell us what the gospel is, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So if you're going to be saved, you need to believe that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. Right? Uh, it says, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then in verse 5 he says, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 people. So this is not something that was done in secret. This is not something that was in some hidden spot where, where there was no eyewitnesses, where there was no testimony. It's factual. We, we can trust in this. We can put our hope in, in this gospel and this truth. And all God asks you to do is believe. Believe that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is the focal point of the gospel. It's what he did. It's not what anybody else did. Mary did not go to the cross and die and pay for your sins. She didn't. Is she blessed? Yes, she's blessed. Yeah. Chosen among women and blessed. She's the mother of the humanity of Christ, and we should honor her from generation to generation and recognize the important role that she's played. We should never diminish her in any way, shape, or form. But at the same time, we want to be very careful as we're talking to our Catholic friends and to others who have, who have turned Mary into something that, would, uh, that she would never accept Amen. and would never approve of and certainly is not taught in the scripture, but, but continues to be the vain traditions of men. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Do we have any quick questions before we close? Amen. Uh, a yes, Julia says a question. Jesus came in the form of a man. Why? Jesus came in the form of a man for several reasons. Certainly to die to pay for our sins. God, as God, does not die. He is eternal life. 
as a man he can come into the world and save us. So, to, to enter into the world, that comes in the form of a man, but all men are sinful. And we kind of mentioned already the fact that, that, he, that the sinful nature is passed on by the man. So Joseph cannot be Jesus' biological father. He cannot have a biological father. Right? It has to be a supernatural birth. Jesus tells us in several different places why he's coming to the world. He came to save sinners, Paul says, of whom I am chief. He came into the world to, to seek and to save the lost. He came into the world to fulfill the promises that were made to the fathers. So he himself tells us, the scripture tells us, several reasons why he's come. But he has certainly come to save us. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We are hopeless. And, and without, we have no hope were it not for Jesus Christ. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we would be men most miserable. We would have absolutely nothing. So what do we believe? We believe in his death on the cross, and he died to pay for our sins. We believe that he was buried, that he was... When it says that he was buried, what's it talking about? It means he actually died. He really was dead. It's not this lie that he was still alive. He was actually dead. The humanity of Christ was actually dead. He died. He was dead for three days. And he rose again from the dead. What must we believe to be saved? Very simple. We must believe in Christ's death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. We hammer that point. Why do we spend so much time hammering that point? Because the world is telling you a hundred different lies. And they never tell you the truth of how to be saved. You're saved because you believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. God has done all the work. God gets all of the credit. And if you have loved ones and friends, we have young people here today, you have friends at school, you should be telling your friends, Tony, at school. Right? When you go to school and you're talking to your friends, you should be telling them about Jesus Christ. You should be telling them that they need to be saved. Right? You have friends, Lena, right, in school? You should be talking to your friends about Jesus Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. Eddie. I love Eddie. <laughs> Eddie, you should be telling your friends in school about the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not be ashamed to open our mouths and to speak mm -hmm. and to share good news. The good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Dennis, would you close us in a word of prayer, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much that Jesus did come, live on this earth, and was put on the cross, and three days later, from the grave, he arose. It's in Jesus' name we give the honor and the glory. Go with us, Lord, to, to spread the message that God's promise to us is to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, and we will have eternity with him in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray and give you the honor and the glory. Amen. Amen.